I was hoping. <laughs> okay, welcome to the talk tonight. The, the topic is the Jesus that never was. When I present the arguments included in this talk to Christians, the main objection I receive to my conclusions is this, that the overwhelming majority, the overwhelming consensus among biblical scholars is that Jesus was a real historical person. When Christians raise this objection, they're absolutely right. Now, there may be reasons why this is the case. Maybe the colleges who have faculties for biblical studies don't want to scare away funding by being so crass as to say that Jesus never existed. Maybe the scholars who have come to this conclusion don't want to come out and say it because they're nostalgic about the faith they used to have and they don't think it would be a, a very nice thing to destroy the faith of others. For me, though, the greatest gift you can give to an honest truth seeker is the gift of disillusionment. Whatever the reasons for the consensus among scholars, they're irrelevant to this talk tonight. If anyone is to challenge the academic consensus, they must gather the data and make a convincing case that is solid enough to convince people that the consensus needs to change. This is precisely what David and myself will be attempting to do tonight. Once these arguments are made, however, saying that no scholars agree with me or with David is no longer a valid argument. In order to defend the consensus, you must offer a counter-argument to do so. Or go to these scholars who believe this and get their counter-arguments. It doesn't matter how many people believe it if they are wrong or if they have no way of defending their position in a rational manner. I'll be presenting the evidence from the epistles and there is so much of it I fear I won't be able to do it justice tonight. David has the even bigger challenge of presenting the evidence from the Gospels and secular writers in an even shorter amount of time. I don't envy him that. We won't get to the evidence from Acts, but Richard Carrier has recently posted a video covering the, the evidence from Acts, or making arguments from, from Acts, and I recommend you all look it up. It's from the 2012 Skepticon, and well worth a look. Um, can I ask also that if you have questions, comments, or outbursts of hostility, that you keep them till the end of the, the talk. We've got a lot to get through. My goal here tonight is to present an argument accessible and relevant to Christians, as they are the ones we need to convince this is, if, this is ev if we're ever going to arrive at a rational society. This is going to mean a great deal of biblical references. So I'll need to ask the atheists here to suffer with me through this. Hopefully by the end of it, you'll have the tools necessary to challenge your Christian friends. <clears throat> Just a note, a note about the scriptures I'll be using. I've tried to stick to the NIV as much as possible, but it occasionally gets to a scripture that I really liked when I was a Christian, and I always used to read the New American Standard Bible. So I'm, I'm told... Yes. Yeah. Welcome. Anyway, I'm told that was the Bible that Jesus liked to read from the most. So. <laughs> I'm going to begin with the beginning of Acts, <coughs> chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, a speech by Peter to his fellow Jews. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man 
Delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This presentation of the gospel message should be familiar to everyone here. We've had it rammed down our throats for the last 2,000 odd years. My main challenge tonight is this. Why didn't it start out this way? Why, when everyone since has preached the gospel message with an historical Jesus front and centre, would every epistle writer for the first hundred years of Christianity speak only of a divine Jesus and be absolutely silent about his earthly ministry? The only ex sensible explanation for this is that there was no historical Jesus. The Missing Equation. This is directly from Earl Dougherty's book, The Jesus Puzzle. I recommend, uh, if you're interested in this topic, to give it a read. Excellent, excellent source. And here is the missing equation. In the epistles we have 22 documents, roughly 80,000 words, roughly, give or take, 12 different scholars. The scholars are still arguing about how many, who wrote what. More than 500 references to Jesus or Christ or the Son. Zero, absolutely zero references to Jesus of Nazareth or son of Mary, or crucified under Pilate, or Galilee, or Golgotha, or parables, or even the miracles of Jesus. Not one mentions anything that would place Jesus on this earth, or in history, or anything about his earthly ministry. Not a single epistle quotes the supposed founder and focal point of their faith. If anyone wants to argue for an historical Jesus, they must give a reasonable, a reasonable explanation for why the epistle writers go out of their way to ensure that an historical Jesus is never mentioned in their texts. Where there is smoke. This is the general assumption underlying the claim that Jesus had to have existed. Someone must have started it all. So in order for me to make a case, I must first account for all the smoke. All these religious texts and all these ancient people writing about this Jesus fellow must mean something, right? Before I continue, a brief outline of the historical context of these writings is necessary. And if I've got any historians in here, um, please correct me later. Alexander the Great had conquered the entire ancient world uh, in the late 4th century BCE. And after his death, it broke down into three, then four separate, still Hellenised kingdoms, often warring with each other. This brought with it Greek philosophy, Greek culture, Greek religion and language, but it also had a devastating effect upon existing social infrastructure. The state-based religions had to make way, as did the social cohesion these fostered. The general populace were left disenfranchised in this bewildering multiculturalism, without the sense of belonging and meaning that their old religions used to provide. Without the structure and familiarity of state-based religions, the people were left to fend for themselves. This provided the grassroots imperative for a new type of religion, a religion of personal salvation. These new religions share a great deal in common and are collectively called mystery cults. So around the same time that Christianity arose, many other similar religions also arose with their own local flavours, each one with a divine saviour 
each one offering the initiate baptism into eternal life or protection in this life. The cults of Isis, Osiris, Dionysus or Bacchus, Mithra, Persephone, Attis, Demeter, all arise around this same period in history. And right here, I want to say that the similarities between these religions and Christianities is not an argument in itself. It, it can in no way undermine the truth of Christianity, if it is true. It says nothing about the historical claim that Jesus existed, other than that it provides an alternative for where the smoke may have come from. I want to distance myself as far as humanly possible from the abomination the factual inaccuracy that is the zeitgeist moving. My only point is that the rise of Christianity had a perfectly reasonable and cultural explanation, not dependent on a long-haired bearded man wandering around doing miracles. If that man actually existed and we had reliable evidence for it, we would simply put down the emergence of these other similar religions to coincidence or that maybe they copied Christianity. It just so happens though that Christianity grew out of a cultural revolution throughout the Greek speaking world, which has changed the nature of religion ever since. I sometimes think of it as akin to what we in the West went through in the 60s. It has been said that given the nature of mystery cults and knowing the scripture of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, Christianity itself is obvious and inevitable. But again, this is merely an alternative explanation for the smoke. Okay, the Apostle Paul. The majority of the New <coughs> Testament epistles were written by this man. The Apostle Paul, who if we are to believe the portraits painted of him throughout the ages, look some, something like this. Seriously, go home and Google him. Uh, Google him under Google Images and you'll be amazed at the similarities. Okay, what sort of man was he? Well, what can we know about him? We can't really rely on Acts, <coughs> as it's a second century document of dubious historical accuracy. Fortunately, there's plenty in the epistles themselves of Paul to give us a re reasonably good picture of the sort of man he was. A Pharisee of high renown, a zealous persecutor of the early church, he had some kind of radical conversion Acts 9 has a story about it. Uh, I don't have too much of a problem with Acts 9. Uh, it would have gone something like that. Although the other people around hearing the voice of God as well, I'm a bit dubious about it. He never met an historical Jesus, nor did he know of one. I'll get to the nor did he know of one in a second. But even if we are to believe Acts completely, we know he did not ever meet a physical, historical Jesus. He had a vision of what he considered a spiritual being. That is the most we can say. He was given to seeing visions and hearing voices, believed he was in touch with both Yahweh and his divine son. There's no question of this for me. He was so convinced he was happy to die for his belief, not just for him. He had an apocalyptic vision of the divine Jesus coming to gather believers to himself and smite unbelievers. And he's the earliest New Testament writer, mm -hmm. writing in the late 40s and early 50s CE. Uh, that might be a bit uh, oh it's a best agreed upon time frame somewhere in the 50s some scholars do it 40s to 50s some 50s to 60s, and 60s. 
that I favour earlier. And if you want to be safe, 50s will do. His character. People have called him misogynistic uh, and that he condoned slavery. I think these are a result of the times he was in. And really, compared to the times he was in, he was very favourable towards women. Integrity and honesty. This is major. He, he seemed to value these very highly and put himself under that criteria very strictly. He was 100% convinced of his gospel and, it was the on, and that it was the only true salvation. Okay, the Christ of Paul. <laughs> and here we get into the Bible quotes. Galatians 4, 4 to 5. But when the, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as, to sonship. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. This is one of my all time favourites. Have this attitude in yourself, in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Romans 1, 2, and 3. Which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. How on earth can I justify that Paul had no conception of an earthly <coughs> Jesus after reading scriptures like this? Because for Paul, all these, happen, all these things happened in a heavenly realm. Notice that in both of these accounts, or in all of these accounts, there is nothing in them that has any historical or geographical information. No Pilate, Golgotha, not even Jerusalem, no people named who witnessed what happened. We know that Paul was a Hellenised Jew. What we can't know is exactly how Hellenised or how strictly he held to a traditional Jewish cosmology. We can detect plenty of both Greek and Jewish thought in his writings, but we can't know for sure how Platonic his cosmology was. There are hints like 2 Corinthians 12, 1-5, where he says, I must go on boasting, although <coughs> there is nothing to be gained, I will go into visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. So we know he believed in at least three levels of heaven. And from what we know about typical beliefs about cosmology at the time, we can extrapolate and say he probably believed in the usual seven, one for each one of the astronomical bodies, of which the third was considered the highest, where physicality is still a possibility. Above that are realms of pure spirit. How many levels of heaven he believed in is beside the point, though. What is relevant here is that for Paul, there was some level of physicality possible in these realms. And it is here that Jesus was born and was crucified. Even if we posit that his views were more platonic and he believed that heavenly realms were totally spiritual, 
the ultimate reality where only perfect forms existed. It was here that Paul believed that Jesus was born and crucified and rose from the dead. Is this mere conjecture? Is there evidence to back it up? Let's ask Paul. So where does Paul say he gets his knowledge of Jesus from? I'm going to start with Galatians 1, 15 to 17. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, I'll get to that later, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. The Greek word here, en, means in. In the sense of, by means of. Paul is literally saying that, that God chose to reveal his son through me. If Jesus had been an historical person, shouldn't he have gone immediately to the disciples who knew him and verify if his visions were valid? Apart from that, this passionate man on the day of his conversion did not want to immediately go to Golgotha or to Calvary, which is whatever you want to call it, a site where his redemption took place, or to inspect the tomb where his saviour rose from the dead. No. He did not even want to seek out the disciples to get a first-hand account of his new Lord's teaching. No. <coughs> Just pissed off to Damascus to pour over dusty copies of the Hebrew Bible to see what they might reveal about Jesus. The only way to make sense of this is to conclude that Jesus was not historical. And Paul believed that his own revelation about what the scriptures said, what the Hebrew scriptures said, was at least as good as that of the other apostles. After all, he was one of the most bestest Jews going around at the time, in his own estimation. We can read that in uh, Philippians 3. He knew the Hebrew scriptures well and was blessed with visions and the spiritual Jesus constantly in his ear. Who else could claim better than that? One of the disciples of Jesus who had followed him around hearing his teachings could, or his brothers, James or Jude, if Jesus was historical. Paul's actions and attitudes only make sense though if he wasn't. Galatians 1, 11 to 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Here Paul explicitly states that he received it all from a spiritual source. And the implication of the way he has said it is that a gospel of human origin is inferior to the knowledge he has gained. If Jesus was historical, though, this attitude would be incomprehensible. Romans 1, verse 2, the gospel he promised beforehand <coughs> through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This occurs time and time again in Paul. He always goes back to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, when I re used to read the Bible through cover to cover, I, of course, assumed that 
this man here that he meant here the scriptures are just read the gospels they are still a decade from being written when Paul writes this he's talking about the Hebrew Bible Isaiah, the Psalms, Daniel and Habakkuk and I thought I had a bad growing up with a name like Ellery <laughs> how much did his parents hate him man? <laughs> Habakkuk ok Romans 3 21 but now apart from the law the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify for Paul the law and the prophets are his verification that his gospel is valid not the first-hand accounts of the teachings of Jesus himself. Romans 16, 25-27. I love like this. <coughs> this is just gold. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I could proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past but now revealed and made known how? through prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith to the only words of blah 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 not now revealed in the person of Jesus of Nazareth not made known by his son in his earthly ministry but through the prophetic writings of the Hebrew Bible. Well, that's up at top. Do you always do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, exceptions. Back at the start when I laid out the missing equation, I'm hoping that any Christians here would be trying to recall scriptures, scriptures that refute my claims. I'll save you the trouble of looking them up and lay them out for you here. 1 Thessalonians 2, 15 to 16. Talking about the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone. In their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, in this way they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. This is an obvious interpolation. Hang on, I didn't read out the bit where it says about Pontius Pilate, did I? Oh, That's be the first. 1 Timothy 6.13. No, 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 no. It's actually in 1 Thessalonians as well. I must have done the wrong, the wrong verse. It mentions Pontius Pilate in that verse anyway. <laughs> but anyway, it's an obvious in interpolation for a few reasons. It is alluding to the Jewish war and the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple which happened in the early 70s CE, long after Paul had died. And it is gloatingly anti-Semitic, something which Paul never is anywhere else in his writings. If anything, his attitude everywhere else is warmly affectionate towards his own people. The next one's 1 Timothy 6.13. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying to Pontius, before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you. This is also thought to be an interpolation by many scholars, but it's not so obvious. The objection is that the reference doesn't fit well to, into the surrounding text, which for anyone like myself who is not fluent in ancient Greek could not know for themselves. Whatever the case, though, 1 Timothy is not a Pauline document and was written in the early 2nd century CE. So knowledge of the Gospels could have influenced the writer. I would tend towards the notion that it is an interpolation, though, 
as we know of hundreds of such additions in the time since the third century. We have textual evidence for these. Older copies that don't have the changes, so we know that scribes were liberal in their adding to the text to make it better up. The other thing too <coughs> that points towards it being an interpolation is that this is the only piece of data about the life of Jesus that appears in the whole document. So it's unlikely that that would get in and nothing else. Supper. Gee, that got small. <laughs> okay, I'll have to read it out for you. Yeah, that picture's wrong. I reckon Vader should be in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, after all, was the chosen one who brought balance to the force. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. What is missing from this account if, in fact, Paul is recounting an historical event? If it was already a, a tradition established by Jesus, how could Paul be so brazen as to suggest that he is sharing something which he received through a divine revelation? He's writing to an audience as well. Why doesn't anyone else remember this? The word translated as betrayed here is the Greek word paradidomai which can mean betrayed in a limited context, but more regularly translates as offered up or delivered up. The only reason it is tra translated as betrayed in this text is the gospel tradition from which we understand that, that that's what he must mean by paradidomai in this context. But this word is the same word uh, which in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 and 23 is used to describe the action of Paul handing down traditions to believers. And in Jesus' parable of the growing seed in, oh, in Mark 4, 29 or something, I think it is, um, it is used figurative to, figuratively to say that the crop permits itself to be harvested once it's ripe. So you get a sense of the word. Betrayed is the wrong translation in this. Because having the understanding of Paul that this all happened in a heavenly realm, who betrayed Jesus? He says elsewhere in his writings that Jesus offered himself up. So did he betray himself? Did God betray him? He never mentions Judas. Uh, quite glaringly, he doesn't mention Judas. Even when the, the connection with Judas is obvious in what he's saying. Okay, brothers of the Lord. This is huge. This is the one piece of evidence that just keeps on keeping on, uh, according to people who believe that Jesus was a historical figure. Okay, we'll have a look at Galatians 1.19. I saw none of the other apostles. This is when he went, finally went to Jerusalem. Only James, the Lord's brother. This phrase, the Lord's brother, makes little sense within the context of Paul's letter, as he later goes on to show a great deal of disrespect to him, if indeed he thought that James was the biological brother of his Lord. In Galatians 2.6, as for those who were held in high esteem, he, he previous to that mentioned James and Cephas and I think actually James and Cephas were the only two mentioned in it anyway. 
Whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. How on earth can the sibling of his Lord add nothing to his message? Who does Paul think he is here? Who do Paul's readers think he is? If his readers know James is the biological brother of Jesus, they would not think much of this statement from him. It is most likely that this was a later note at the mention of James. Some scribe reading, writing it or reading it writes in the margin, oh James, oh in brackets, brother of the Lord. Later on it gets copied by accident or someone wrote it in there on purpose. James, oh yeah, brother of the Lord. It, it seems obvious that, that it's an interpolation. The earliest copies we have of this manuscript date from the third century CE. So there was plenty of time for tampering between when this was written and what has survived. In any event, even if we grant that it was a part of the, the original text, brother of the Lord could have been an honorary title, as brother and sister usually are in Paul's writings. Adelphos was a common title of initiates in many other mystery cults as well. And James being the head of the church in Jerusalem may have had the honorary title of brother of the Lord. There are over 500 brothers mentioned in the epistles, yet only two of those are literal siblings. Okay, James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Okay, this is a, an epistle supposedly written by James, referred to as the brother of the Lord. Few, if any, serious biblical scholars believe that James the Just wrote this epistle. But the person who did attribute his name to it did so in order to validate the text and give it authority. Surely, if he could have gained extra credibility by claiming to be the biological brother of Jesus, he would have done it. He clearly did not know. You would think if he knew enough about James to want to write it in his name, he must surely have known this about him. Jude 1.1 1, 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus and a brother of James? To those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept the Christ Jesus. Wait, what? <laughs> brother of James. If James and Jude are the brother, brother of Jesus, why would his claim to fame be the brother of James? This makes absolutely no, absolutely no sense. Not an authentic piece of writing anyway. No scholars believe that Jude wrote this either. And if he was a sibling of Jesus, the same as James, why does he only claim to be a servant? Okay, deeper exceptions. So we know that none of the epistles quote Jesus or mention anything about his life apart from his celestial crucifixion and resurrection. Oh, and celestial birth. But the silence runs deeper still. Even when it would profit them greatly to mention teachings of Jesus or aspects of his life, they fail to do so. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 24 says, Jews demand a sign and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
Paul often boasts of his own miracles, yet he seems to expressly deny that Jesus did any and suggests that the Jews are silly for wanting them. He does not mention either any of the wise sayings of Jesus to give the Greeks something to chew on. Couldn't he simply say to both of these groups, we got lots, we got lots of both those things. Plenty of miracles, plenty of wisdom, plenty of teaching. So why doesn't he? Romans 15.9. Ah, oh, this, is, this is him boasting. Oh, I don't think I've put those up. He says, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of true, the, a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. Yet Jesus never did. Go figure. <laughs> okay, Hebrews 7. The writer of Hebrews, it wasn't Paul, but the writer of Hebrews, in the whole chapter, is comparing Christ to Melchizedek, the high priest, yet never mentions that he, like Jesus, had a ritual meal where he offered up a blessing. We've got Genesis 14, 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So we can say that at least the writer of Hebrews was not aware that a Lord's Supper had ever happened. The event where Jesus supposedly established a new covenant. You would think someone so deeply into covenants would have found out about this one. Pretty much the whole of Hebrews 7 and 8 is about the Old Covenant compared to the New Covenant. Never mentions Jesus saying, as Paul says he said, or Mark or Matthew or uh, Luke, or John actually for that matter. I know John doesn't have one, does he? Um, this is the cup of the New and Everlasting Covenant. Doesn't mention it. Okay, one... Corinthians 11.27 So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Is that rearing in any bells for any of you? No mention of Judas here. The obvious, obvious screaming out comparison that he could make. Drops the ball completely. Does not even mention it. <coughs> I mean, those things that I've gone through, I was running out of time. I had a whole heap of them. There's, there's just so many of those things where someone's making an argument, like Paul saying, talking about marriage, could quote directly, Jesus spoke on marriage, could quote him directly and say, Jesus said it, the founder, the teacher, the saviour, he said it, so follow it. Knock down argument. Never does it. Neither do any of the other epistle writers. It's unbelievable. No one ever, ever quotes him. Okay, appearances of the risen Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 5-8. And that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. I'm not sure what he means by that, but anyway. Okay. 
this is, this is used by Christians as some sort of record of eyewitness event. Jesus appearing after his crucifixion and this is an account of all the eyewitnesses that saw him risen from the dead. But we know that Paul's appearance was a vision and not a physical appearance at all. Yet he lists it as if it's the same as all of these other appearances. Did they all just have visions of a spiritual being? Reading Paul, it would seem so. This list makes no historical sense whatsoever if the Gospels or Acts are to be believed. In Acts 1.15, it says, In those days, and this is the, the Pentecost, this is directly after Jesus was resurrected, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. So we know that Jesus ascended around this time, so where'd the other 380 brethren come from? This order of events is not supported by Acts or any of the Gospels, which all contradict each other anyway on who saw Jesus and in what order. But still, it makes no sense for any other reason either. Jesus appeared to Cephas first, then the twelve. Apparently, Peter wasn't one of the twelve or something. Now, Judas was dead here, and Matthias had not yet replaced him, according to the book of Acts. So, shouldn't it be 11? But if you take out Peter, shouldn't it be 10? Uh, then over 500, and only after all these people, he gave his brother a visit. <laughs> and the leader of the Jerusalem church thought he might be worth checking in on this time. <laughs> So Christians like to claim this as eyewitness testimony of the resurrection. At best, at the absolute best, it can be said to reflect a bunch of people who reported that they experienced in a spiritual sense, but especially with the 500 plus, some, some vision of Jesus. Now, if there's 500 people in a group, and everyone's saying that they've experienced the risen Lord, we know enough in, in modern psychology to know that no one's going to stand up and say, sorry, no, I didn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Must have missed out. So how they can claim this as eyewitness evidence is, is baffling. This, this passage made, raises much more problems for his historicity than it can possibly hope to solve. So much more. Paul's apocalypse, I, I mean, I could give a whole talk on this. Paul repeatedly talks about the coming of the Lord not the second coming of the Lord, not the returning of the Lord. He's talking about the promise in the scriptures of the coming of the Lord. He hasn't been here yet. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the Paul's apocalyptic visions are, are a whole other topic. Okay, Colossians 1, 26. This is not Paul, by the way, but another epistle writer says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people by the apostles. You'd, you'd say. Not in the person of Jesus. Not, oh, now he's finally come. 1 Peter 1.20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Revealed really Titus 1 2 to 3 in the hope of eternal life which God who do, does not lie actually agree with that you can't lie if you don't exist but promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season 
he is brought to light through what? The preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. Okay. Ephesians 3, 4 to 5. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Colossians 2.2 My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. It, it just seems so obvious time and time again when any epistle writer is talking about Jesus, talking about a spiritual being. In the blurb for this talk, I said I would be proving beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus never existed as a historical figure. You might have thought when you read that statement that it was an impossibly bold claim. But I want to stress here the word reasonable. Can you honestly give me reasons why not only Paul, but every epistle writer for the first hundred years of Christianity had no interest in talking about the supposedly historical events of Jesus' life and ministry? Why none of them quoted his teachings, even when it would pro profit their argument to do so? Why they would enforce their own attitude of indifference to the historical Jesus upon the believers they were writing to, who surely must have been gagging to know about the man and his ministry. If you cannot reasonably account for all these things in your own holy scripture, then you must conclude, as I have, that Jesus could not possibly have ever lived in a physical body on this earth. Thank you.